Good morning. I'm happy to be here on my fifth year. And Sandra, Hans, and I were just talking when we started. You were one round table. And then you became one octagon table. And now it's a full house. Next time you'll need the arena to house all the top leaders and executives and those interested in resilience. And we start the day with the good news, as always, that it is anticipated and committed that the Philippine government, the president, will finally ratify the climate agreement. And I think that deserves a round of applause considering that today we are celebrating the commemorating, perhaps not celebrating, Yolanda, November 8, you have the Top Leaders Forum and the confirmation that indeed the Executive Department will ratify the agreement and send it to the Senate for its concurrence. And uh, last November 4, the climate agreement entered into force with more than 55 nations, comprising more than 55% of total greenhouse gas emissions in the world. And so much is happening, and in this room, I just feel so inspired that we have grown from the first time that Mr. Han C met with then UNISDR head Margareta Wallstrom five years ago. And when Hans first asked me, Lauren, what is disaster risk reduction? What is Ms. Wallstrom talking about? I said, you talk. They talked, immediately he embraced it figuratively speaking, of course, uh, with passion and direction and vision, and with Annie and Lisa and the efficient SM team, they started. And now, with Sandra and all of you present here today, we can see that the future is indeed brighter, better, safer, and more resilient. And so, congratulations, Hans. I'm so proud of you, and really, of all the businessmen I know, it was the best decision to introduce you to Margareta because nagbunga at bumunga ng maganda. Maraming salamat. So I don't need to greet everyone. I'm sure uh, I have said hello to you in the room and everyone. Let me just allow me to congratulate the organizers of the fifth Top Leaders Forum for getting our stakeholders together to inform and stimulate public conversation on the theme it's so apt, science and technology towards building resilience. I have one message to everyone in this forum this morning. We should not assume that science, research, and the tools they offer will just automatically find their way into the drawing boards of policymakers, of businessmen, of urban planners, and those charged to lead action in building more resilient communities. We need to face the fact that science in the field of disaster risk reduction and management more often than not is ignored. Decisions that impact on millions of people regrettably are oftentimes made with sometimes scant consideration for scientific and academic research. I am a policymaker. I interface with people from the bureaucracy, local executives, people from all walks of life every day. I've seen how action oftentimes are guided by what is popular, by what is easier to undertake, sometimes by what has the least cost considerations. I think that this has to change. We need to accept the fact that disaster risk landscape requires a more focused, evidence-based assessment of hazards, vulnerability, and disaster risks. And this can only be done through science. We have Tony Losaiga here of the MO, Father Jet Villarian, and I'm sure they are the knowledgeable people who can guide us through this. This forum should focus less on understanding the role of science and technology in building more resilient communities and businesses. We all know that by now. The bigger question should be, what is stopping us from using science and technology in our bid to build 
more resilient communities and businesses. Future cities are not built after our time. We start building them today. Communities 50 years from now will definitely look different. People will live differently. Their realities will not be defined in their time, but in the lifetime of generations before them, and that is now. Communities and businesses that withstand one or two disasters do not define resilience. We need to build communities that will withstand the greatest disaster risks of our time. And this is only possible if we are guided by an understanding of climate variability and change, as well as their impacts and the processes that control the climate system and how it actually evolves. We need to map out our natural resources so we can promote the protection and stewardship of our resources. We need to understand the impact of businesses on the environment because while business and industry, of course, create opportunities for our communities, they can also sometimes undermine efforts to promote sustainability. Land use plans that are risk sensitive are vital. Hazard maps can provide good foundation for the work of our planners and our builders. With the high reliability of disaster data, the private sector will also be better equipped to carry out its role in disaster risk planning, preparedness, and response, and will be more confident to enter the risk financing schemes without fear of massive losses. Knowing when, where, and in what magnitude a typhoon will strike is fundamental to keeping our people prepared. In all of these that I have said so far, science, research, technology, innovation have an indispensable role to play. Exactly three years ago today, Super Typhoon Haiyan shocked the world as it decimated the communities that lay directly in its path, leaving a trail of death and destruction that compounded poverty in the countryside, slowed down rural development in affected provinces and regions, and on the national level, scaled back economic growth. Until now, three years later, housing and many more needs remain unmet. An assessment of Tacloban, which greatly bore the brunt of the storm's impact, showed that the city's location is highly susceptible to disaster risks. The geohazard map for Tacloban showed a province massively covered by color purple on its outskirts, red within, meaning to say the coastal areas were susceptible to flooding. The inland was highly susceptible to landslides. The map's color coding scheme represented susceptibility to landslides and flooding, but the people of Tacloban and outlying areas in the province, in the region, came to know that only after the fact. Days before Hayan hit land, there were public warnings from Pag-asa. There was even, of course, news and information was given out and preemptive evacuation was carried out in coastal areas. Those who did not heed the warning tragically met the same fate of thousands who moved to evacuation sites. Still, those who were supposed to oversee disaster risk management operations also became the victims themselves. Emergency relief resources were prepared. Some were prepositioned, including more than 84,000 family food packs, assorted medicines, medical supplies, cot beds, other essential materials worth 328.7 million pesos. Director Palma knows because he was the head at the time. As we have seen, those preparations were made, but still not enough. So we ask, what else can we do? What went wrong? In hindsight, how else can we prepare? A disaster management expert said that, and I quote, even the best prepared nation would have a hard time bracing itself against the effects of such a storm. We cannot, however, 
submit ourselves to utter helplessness without statement in the face of mounting disaster risks. We need to be in control. And the only way that can happen is to embrace the lessons learned from Haiyan, from Karen, from Lawin, from Sendong, from Pablo, from Ondoy, and many more. And to move forward, not just with the resolve, but with the tools and the science to do it better. Government and businesses cannot just be enablers of research. We cannot just be facilitators for knowledge creation. They need not be users of the knowledge that science and technology creates. They need to be the users, not just enablers and supporters, but actually operationalizing the use of science, technology, and innovation. Each year, billions of pesos are being channeled to finance scientific research, a significant part of which funds climate research, environmental mapping, meteorological research, establishment of GIS hub for disaster risk reduction and climate change, even air quality monitoring, land use mapping, just to name a few. How much of these are actually carried out in partnership with our scientific and research community? And how much of their outputs actually find their way into our planning? What we want to see is government funding this, and we have the funds, believe me, there's so much unobligated, unutilized funds by the billions, and government to partner with the scientific academic sector, not just to fund and facilitate, and for the output to be used by the private sector, by private and government planners, so that businesses and industry can benefit from that. There is a saying that organizations are only as good as their weakest link. I would rather focus on the positive and say that we can only be stronger and better if we recognize the value that all stakeholders can bring to the table. The only way we can build more inclusive and resilient communities is by getting everyone to participate and contribute to the task of building more resilient communities. We have the best scientists and academic institutions in the world. Government and businesses need to reach out to them. I also wish to address myself to the scientific and research and academic communities. I understand that the gold standard of a researcher's output is the publication of peer-reviewed articles in scholarly journals. Our scientists and research community, however, will also need to communicate the practical value of what they are doing. The end should not be focused on just publishing a paper, which is deemed very important, of course, but also making sure these contribute to creating the knowledge that serves the needs and interests of communities today and in the future. Our biggest challenges include those of getting all hands on deck, so to speak, providing the resources to make science work for building resilient communities and businesses and translating all this knowledge into practice that we should see and feel. And this can only happen if we use the science to reduce the risk. We need a science-based governance in building disaster resilience, in managing hazard-associated risks. The government's NOAA program launched many years ago is a good start but we need other stakeholders to be involved in this project. Our DNR has completed the geohazard maps at a scale of one is to 10,000. It is important that all local governments and businesses have this one is to 10,000 map. And if you don't have it, we can compel government to give it to the private sector for after all, this is funded by taxpayers' money. It is the responsibility of government to reach out to the private sector so you use the science or the output that we fund. The Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction tells us that managing the risk is a key to resilience. We acknowledge this and our resolve to build more resilient communities is more pronounced. And in all of these, science is our ally. The changing environmental landscape poses various challenges that would likewise change the business landscape. 
but forward-thinking companies will see adaptation as an opportunity to innovate and to contribute to improving the environment. So just to recap this 10-minute message in simple words, we must not rebuild the risks. If we use science and technology and innovate, if we build strong and wise today, there will be no need to rebuild in the future. Thank you very much. Good morning.